Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 4. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 4. We'll take our launching pad text out of this chapter, and then we'll begin to look at some of the parables as we look at our Lord's talks. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But we have looked at thus far, and I'm calling this 20 Steps from Glory to Glory. Uh, we've looked at our Lord's transcendence, some of His traits, uh, His theophysies as He comes through the precious Word of God before His uh, birth. Then we looked at our Lord's times and our Lord's transfer, and then the torch bearer, which is John the Baptist, and then His temptation, uh, His twelve. And we finished last week with his, some of his teachings. By no means is this covering it all, uh, but we're looking at a survey of our Lord's life to get, out, get a hunger and a thirst uh, after his life and uh, his pattern and the manner of walks as he was on the surf for 30, uh, 33 and a half years. Tonight I want to pick up with our series. We'll look at a different aspect of it. And we want to look at our Lord's talks. I take this, if you'll look back in chapter number 4 of Luke, I want to begin reading in verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him, and underline those last three words if you don't already, already have them underlined, or if you don't have them circled, for a season. He was not done by any means, and I believe it was constantly at times that uh, he would come to where the Lord was at or try to do something to hinder our Lord's talks and his walk. Verse number 14, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And that went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Now here's our words. And he taught in thy synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And that was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Verse number 32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Tonight we pick up with this tenth step of our Lord, many more than that, but this is a tenth that we are looking at, uh, where we see our Lord's talks. In these talks, we are going to look at his parables. These parables are fascinating things to me, as we will look at five different aspects of them. They've been broken down into five different sections. And tonight we'll begin looking at our Lord's salvation parables. Uh, the majority of them will be given to us in Matthew and Luke. And as we look at these, we find that there's divine favor in salvation. There's divine forgiveness in salvation. And there's divine fullness in salvation. Uh, you and I tonight realize, as we told you Sunday and many other times, Salvation is of the Lord, and we are so thankful tonight that God has let us in on it. It's a work of God that God does in our heart and opens our eyes and draws us unto himself. Jesus had saved his disciples, these 12. We looked at that at a different segment where we looked at the 12 disciples, looking at the element of each one of their lives, and he had saved them all but one. Uh, Judas, of course, was not saved. Uh, we see that in the scriptures, proved in the scripture. Uh, but of these 12 men, he gave some many valuable lessons for us to look at. Uh, and we thank God for God doing that. And then after uh, the 12, we looked at his teachings, and now we're seeing his talks. The first parable that I want to look at tonight 
uh, the first parable that we will look at in these coming weeks as we'll be looking at salvation parables tonight, uh, beginning to, and then we will look at the service parables, and then stewardship parables, and then the second advent parable, and then the severity parables, judgments of our Lord as he's given. And so the word parable means to place beside. Uh, it has been called to cast alongside. Uh, it has been called a, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Our Lord was the best at giving parables. He was the best of all teachers that's ever been. Uh, we pattern our lives. Paul says, be ye followers of me as I am a follower of Christ." And when we follow Christ and we look to him, we find out uh, that his teachings are absolutely the best that have been given. His pattern of preaching is the best that you could follow and the best pattern that we could follow. He used illustration after illustration after illustration. And he did that many times by the area he was in. For example, the parable of the sower. Uh, he was there talking to his disciples, looked up his, across the field, and he saw a sower. He, sa he said, behold, a sower went forth to sow. And he used that sowing of the seed. And that seed, of course, is the word of God. And the three, three, parable, the three things that he used there, or the four elements that he used there, was the conditions of man's heart. Uh, only the Lord could take such simple renderings and such simple teaching and give such profound truth. One of the greatest messages, a series of messages that any preacher could ever preach on salvation of what genuine salvation really is, is found in Matthew 13 on the parable of that sower because it deals with the conditions of the heart of mankind. Only one out of that four were saved, and that is the good ground hearer. And that's, that's because, that was, and even uh, the, the, the fallow ground where it fell upon, and that where it fell among those stones and fell among those rocks and there, uh, they believed for a while. They had a head knowledge. And only time and time alone uh, will reveal to you if a person is genuinely saved. And that good ground here, of course, uh, the way we know that they were saved is because they brought, brought forth fruit, some thirtyfold some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold, but by their fruits you shall know them. You're going to have some type fruit uh, if you're the right tree, if you're planted in the right orchard. If you have been saved by the grace of God, you will have some type of fruit to show that. And so our Lord begins to give parables uh, uh, concerning his teaching as he teaches, talks to his disciples and talks to his people and talks to us concerning the salvation parable. A parable is a form of teaching in which uh, it's thrown belong, uh, uh, which, which one thing is thrown beside another and is compared uh, there. And because it was spoken and involves comparison, it can be called a, a verbal a object lesson as our Lord was dealing with, as this, uh, as you see this. And so we see that was Christ, one of Christ's familiar in one of his favorite ways of teaching and preaching as he taught that three and a half years uh, in his ministry uh, concerning the church and concerning salvation and the things that we need to learn from him. You will find, of course, that there were 35 recorded miracles of our Lord, but there are over 30 recorded parables of our Lord. And of these over 30 recorded parables uh, in the Gospels, he implemented this form of teaching as a method of, rest, of revelation and instruction to his children uh, and, of course, to his disciples. He gave them as not only instructions but a method of comfort and a method of warning as he brought it down so a child could understand it. That is, if he wanted to reveal it to you. This is profound, and although it is profound in substance and emphasis, his parabolic teachings portrayed him as the least technical of all religious teachers. Thank God he was down to earth, although he was the deepest teacher that has ever taught. Every time he opened his mouth, it was profound, but yet with such simplicity that even a child could understand. I learned a long time ago, early in this ministry, uh, that the Lord does not deal, does not like shallowness. He likes simplicity. 
There's a big difference in being shallow in something than being simple in something. Some of the most simple, true, profound truths that you'll find, find in the Word of God were just simple teachings of our Lord, as we will be looking at tonight uh, in the, one of these well-known parables in Luke chapter 15. And so as we see the, the, this teaching of our Lord, there's uh, the evidence resembles and uh, differences between parables and allegories as you look in the Word of God and similes. A simile is a resem- it resembles something. And then the metaphors that we talk about in the Word of God is simple biblical language that it, re- it represents something. Uh, one represents, the other resembles uh, and our Lord used much of this in His teachings, especially in these parabolic things that He's given us. And so there's uh, three different areas in these five sections that His parables were broken down into, and that's theoretic, evangelistic, and prophetic. Instead of examining all the parables, we'll not look at all of them uh, and get into detail. That's not my, uh, not my goal and not my aim but I want to look at these special headings and we'll break them down into five special headings uh, in, in the coming week. And tonight we'll begin in the first one. The first one is where our Lord always began, salvation. Uh, many try to go the other way and come back to that, but you always start with the foundational principle of the heart being right with God so you can get the rest of them. You cannot be a great servant and you cannot be a servant of our Lord until you've been saved. And so he deals with the salvation aspect of it. Simplicity. This is so simple, but yet profound when you begin to look at it. I want you to turn as you would know the well-known parable is found in the gospel that we're in. Luke chapter number 15, as we begin tonight to look at the salvation parable. This first group of parables we'll observe, it magnifies the great truth of salvation. And as we've looked at in Sunday school, it is so great a truth. How should we escape uh, if we neglect so great a truth? And so it's a, so great a salvation. And so this is a great salvation that our Lord is talking about. Why is it so great? Because it deals with Him. And it points people to Him. And anything He's involved is, it cannot be anything but great. And so our Lord talks about this salvation parable in this first group as it magnifies uh, this great truth because of the gospel character and salvation emphasis. Uh, Some of these stories have been labeled the parables of grace. Uh, It's a thing down down south, deeper south than you go. Uh, Many of the preachers there have a term that he's a grace preacher. I, I, I was preaching the grace of God before I ever heard that term. Uh, but when they say he's a great preacher, what they, grace preacher, they are saying that he believes in the five uh, points of Calvinism or he believes in the five points uh, of, of these things. I, I'm not a Calvinist, but I'm the grace of God preach, uh, preacher. I, I don't baptize babies. Uh, and I believe the grace of God and God had to do the work and draw. Don't mark me as a Calvinist. I, 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 I detest that. Uh, I, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't even identify with a Calvinist. Uh, I'm a Bible believer. I'm a Bible teacher. I use Bible terms and use the things this Bible talks about. And if you want to mock me as that group by saying that God has to do the, do the work, if that cranks your truck, crank it. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, it is the grace of God that saves an individual. And only God that can do this. But I'll preach whosoever will until I go to glory. Uh, and every other preacher that preaches the Bible should preach whosoever will. We don't know who they are. God does. Yes, he died for, for the select, elect. He did do that. But God elects them. I don't. That's God's business. I'd be crazy tonight to tell you that God didn't know who was going to get saved uh, before they got saved. He's God. He knows it all. He's out there. So I preach the whole counsel of God to every individual and thank God that he cranked my truck. That he did a work in my heart. That he did the work of grace in my heart and drew me unto himself. And I'm thankful for that. And so, But you'll never find in the word of God that God elected one to go to hell except Judas. And you can't do anything with that. He used John the Baptist on one side of the coin and Judas on the other side. And you have absolutely nothing to do with that. You just believe the word of God that God used those men to accomplish his purpose. And I'm thankful tonight. Thank God for the drawing grace of God. 
yes, God does do, uh, do the enlightening. Yes, God does have to do, uh, do the work. And yes, God does, uh, do, does that. But he never takes the responsibility off of man. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to believe God will do what he said he would do. And I thank God for the day that I believe. You better leave here tonight shouting it with both hands stretched towards heaven that there's a day that you believe. You just thank him that you got in. You don't figure this thing out. You just praise him and witness to the whole world. Preach a counsel of God and preach a word of God to the whole world. God will step over who he wants, draw who he wants, save who he wants when he gets ready. But God knows who's coming and when they're coming. And so if that marks me, so be it. Mark me. I'm a grace preacher. And so therefore we see the grace of God exhibited in these words and in these things that are before us tonight uh, concerning uh, the salvation aspect of our Lord. And so here we see that these truths show the gracious works and gracious words uh, that proceeded out of his mouth in Luke chapter 4 and verse number 22. And so let's look at some of these words that uh, proceeded out of his mouth. The thing that we see in the salvation uh, aspect Aspect of the salvation parable is a divine favor that's shown in it. Would anybody here tonight have the audacity to set, stand up and say uh, that you say, but that's not the favor of God. It's because of something you deserved, uh, something that, that, that you worked towards, and something uh, that, 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 that you really deserved in your life. Nobody in their right mind would say that. Anything that God does concerning man is grace involved. And anything that God has done for us is favor that God has shown towards us to save us. And God will say, and, and the blessed hope for this world and the blessed hope for all mankind is that they come to Jesus Christ. But they are not going to be saved if they don't see themselves a sinner. They are not going to be saved if they don't come God's way. Just you hearing the gospel is not going to save you. Just you believing the gospel is not going to save you. You've got to come up with a thing of saying, I believe, Lord, I, I believe that you will do what you said that you will do. I, I, I believe that you will save me. And I believe that you are Lord. I believe that thank God that you will save me and you will take care of my sins I'm asking you and I believe this with all my heart and I believe you're who you said you are God will save you if you believe that God puts that in that that's called faith by faith you believe God will do that and thank God he'll keep you and we see this aspect of it here in, in this Luke chapter 15 one of the greatest parables greatest parable in the word of God concerning salvation that he's given as uh, far as knowing how to be saved and again, seeing the work of salvation done, Matthew 13 is. But the illustrations of salvation, Luke 15 is. And so he illustrates this in three different ways concerning his divine favor being seen. Now we see all through this chapter, in chapter 15, it is a, it's one parable. I've told you this countless times, you ought to know this automatically. It's, it's not three different parables here. It's one parable given three illustrations. And the reason he's given three illustrations here for this one parable is because always when it's salvation involved, it's a work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. None are divorced from the other. And so we see here that God shows this and portrays this in Luke chapter 15 as we see this divine favor that is shown. It's a classic in and of itself. This chapter contains Christ's parable involving the lost silver, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And certainly all three of these phrases of the story remind us that sinners are lost and they're separated from God. Each, one, each illustration gives us a story of separation. They're separated here. Uh, different individuals are different things or different illustrations that's used. But the bottom line is when you're lost, you're separated from God. When you're lost, that's the vision between you and God. And there must be a work of the Trinity, a work of God himself uh, to get you back to where you need to be. And you must believe that. And so here the story reminds us that sinners are lost and separated from God. But in each account, the favor of God is set forth in the recovery of each one, in the return 
of each one and the reception of each one that's experienced in the salvation. Let's look at this chapter. I know it's familiar with you, and I know it's familiar territory. Uh, but I, I want to say we never need to get too familiar with the basic truths of the Word of God that reveals to us that salvation is of the Lord. Look, read along if you will. Look if you will at the first thing that we see in chapter 15 and verse number 1 of Luke. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Well, could I say that they couldn't hear any better? That's the it's best, that's the best person they could hear. Uh, that, that's the one they needed to hear because when he opens his mouth, he speaketh with power and with authority. Now notice what it says in verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes remembered, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Could I ask you a point blank question? Who in the name of God's heaven is he going to eat with and receive if he doesn't eat with and receive sinners? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the reason he says in another parable, in another place a little later on that we will be looking at, they that are righteous need not a salvation. They don't need a physician. If they did a whole or they that are not sick, he said, you've got to realize you need to be saved. That, that goes back to the salvation thing. And aren't you glad he stopped over at your place and give you sense enough and you had sense enough and your responsibility is I can't save myself. Lord, I'm too sorry to be saved. I, I'm glad, thank God, that you'll save me. I just believe you. And God does that. And so here he's telling about, and he uses this illustration of all people that he's talking to. He's talking to his disciples with his talks. But here he's using this illustration for a religious crowd. These are religious people. These are people that know it all. These are people that think they got it together. And look at verse number 3. You should have all the stuff down, but I'm just reviewing it. It says, and he spake, what does it say? This next two words. This parable. He didn't say he spake these parables. He spake this parable unto them. Now, who does the them refer to? It refers back to the crowd he was just talking about. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes remembered, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. So he spake this parable unto them, his disciples, concerning the Pharisees and the murmuring crowd and the ones that would listen. Let me use this term. He spake this parable unto anybody that would listen. And so anybody there that was sharing. He, then he talks about here the lost sheep. He's here going to reveal in these verses the restoring work of the Son. The sheep, as we read these verses, we'll find it's lost in ignorance. Let me remind you tonight that sheep are the most dumbest animals on the face of this earth. You cannot drive a sheep. You cannot drive them. You have to lead them. And so the Lord uses this terminology. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than ni over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That refers back to people that are not already saved. That refers to the self-righteous crowd. Don't lose sight now of who he's talking to. Don't lose. Our Lord has taken this opportunity to blast them. He's taken this opportunity to give the layer the foundation to show them this is a self-righteous crowd. This is a crowd that they th th think they don't need God. This is a crowd that think they are all right. They are in the wilderness. They are not in heaven. They are not in Canaan. They are not in, in the feast of heaven. They are not around that. They are in the wilderness. And so the Lord goes and he finds this one sheep that's lost. Thank God. And he saves it. He says that's rejoicing in heaven over the one one in 99 that knows that they're lost and repents and comes uh, to the saving knowledge of God. He's using that as the restoring work of the Son. Let me ask you a question. Who's going to restore a lost soul except the Son? Nobody. And so he's showing us here in this first one, there must be a restoring work done for a soul that's lost. For a sinner that's lost, there's got to be a restoring work. Because a sinner cannot restore himself. 
He cannot fix himself. It must have help from God. And so this sheep is lost in ignorance. You and I were lost in ignorance. We didn't realize what we were and who we were, why we were and all this stuff until God done a revealing work to us or we got under the sound of the gospel or we were uh, witnessed to uh, by someone that was saved and uh, we were in ignorance concerning this religious stuff until we were told it was passed down to us. Here we see in these seven verses, and you can put this in your Bible, this is nothing but the grace of God that this shepherd left that fold and come and got this one to start with. And so here the grace of God is seen in this restoring work. Uh, this sheep shows us that we are detached from God because of sin. The sheep was detached because of sin. Here there's a manifestation of life seen. We could say that you could put Jesus Christ here beside these seven verses as Jesus saying, I am the way. And so thank God he's the way to get you into the fold. He's the way to get you saved. And then let's look at this next illustration that he gives. He said, this is good, but I got another illustration to lay down and I want you to get a hold of this. Verse number eight, notice he picks up. He doesn't change, he doesn't change gear. He just picks up with the same story, picks up with the same theme, picks up with the same uh, situation that they are lost. Notice the word either, which woman having 10 pieces of silver. Now, did you get that? It went from one out of 99 to one out of 10. He's narrowing it down because he's hid it somewhere. He's bringing it down to the salvation to what it all is. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing between you and God. Don't ever lose sight of that. You can get saved in a crowd, but it's an individual work that God does in that heart. And your individual eyes being open and you coming. And thank God one out of 99. Thank God for the one. That's one out of ten. Let's continue reading. It says, does not light a, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. When she has found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. You notice there's something here. You pick it up on this. That's rejoicing in the first one. That's rejoicing in the second one. Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of angels. The angels are not rejoicing. Why would they rejoice? They don't have a clue of what's happening. They are not redeemed. They can't be redeemed. They, are, they don't know anything about redemption. They are wondering what these crowds are rejoicing. So I asked you a question. If the angels are not rejoicing, if it's in the presence of angels, who's doing the rejoicing? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Plus, this is my little pet thing here. I believe all the saved that can see what's going on down here. I personally, I can't prove it. Don't come to me after church and ask me to give you scripture. I cannot prove. This is just my little thing and my little, that I believe personally, that I believe that the saved people that have gone on to glory <laughs> and the ones that are already there can see everything that God wants them to see that's happening good, but nothing bad. You said that, I, I don't know about that. I don't care if you know about it or not. That's just my belief. Uh, you don't have to believe that whatsoever. Uh, but I believe they see what's going on. I believe when one gets saved, there's rejoicings in the presence of angels. And I believe that there's a, when one gets saved. Uh, that mama that prayed for that child for years and years and years and they never got saved. And then they go on to glory. And then that individual child gets saved uh, later on in life or what have you. I believe God's got a way to say, come here. Look here. Look what happened. I just saved your girl. And I believe that's rejoicing in heaven. I believe that's a shouting in glory. I believe there's a shouting time. God, I got coops all over. I believe that's, that there's a shouting going on in glory that God reveals to his saints uh, concerning that. God reveals the good things, but none of the bad. Uh, it wouldn't be heaven if we could see the bad stuff was going on. He knows what's going on, but he's got such a power and such a way that he deals with people that he can show us the good things that's happening and thank God waiting for them to come. And so here we see the lost sheep represents the restoring uh, work of the Son, lost out of ignorance, showing us and emphasizing the grace of God. But this lost silver shows us the revealing work of the Spirit, lost in carelessness, and showing us the love of God. And so you cannot be saved until the work of God is done in your heart. This Bible reveals that. Uh, you cannot be come to God unless He draws you, opens your eyes, and shows you who you really are. And so therefore, that's the Spirit of God's work. And so no nobody gets saved apart from the Lord restoring them, the 
Son. Nobody gets saved apart from the revealing work of God showing you who you are and showing you who He is. And so therefore in your callousness and out of your, at the Spirit of God doing that revealing work shows you the love of God. This coin is lost not because of the detachment of sin, although it represents that. This, this coin is lost because of the darkness of sin. There must be a light revealed. She lit the candle because it was in darkness. Uh, we have to have the light turned on when we're saved. We are blinded by the God of this world. We are walking around in darkness. And so you see our Lord puts the simplicity of this coin being lost. They knew what he was talking about. They knew uh, what it was to lose one of those coins. They knew what the Lord was talking about here. And so there's a light. Uh, there's a manifestation not only of life. Jesus says, I am the way. But in this illustration. He says, I'm not only the way, I am the truth. Not only am I the life that you need, but I am the light that I turn on to give you that light. And so therefore you see the two illustrations that he's given them. One out of ten. One out of nine, nine, one out of a hundred. Uh, and then so we get to this third one. Not only do we see the lost sheep, uh, the restoring work of the son, lost out of ignorance, the grace of God emphasized. Not only do we see the lost silver the revealing work of the Spirit lost out of callousness, the love of God emphasized, but we see the lost Son, the receiving work of the Father. This is lost on purpose, not just because of ignorance, but willingly, going His way willingly. And go, I will arise and go to my Father willingly, but He arose and went the other way willingly. And so He asked that. So this is one out of two. There's two sons. Now let's get down to the gist of the story. Look, if you will, at verse... No, I'm not confusing you, am I? Everybody with me? Verse number 11. Here's what the whole thing was about as he started out talking to those Pharisees and those publicans and talking to those sinners and talking to his disciples. Here's the whole gist of what he said. He's laid the foundational work. He's given two basic illustrations. Now he comes and he lowers the boom. And he said, a certain man had two sons. You'll notice verse 11, if you've got the right kind of Bible, starts off with what word? And. And in the word of God is a what? A continuation. So he's continuing his story. He's picking up at what he said. He's just told that. He says, and now I want to tell you about the lost son. Actually, we should say lost sons. Because both of these sons are lost. And he says, that's lost son. This shows the receiving work of the Father lost on purpose. This is the deceitfulness of sin. Every sinner is deceived because of sin. Every sinner is in darkness because of sin. Every sinner is detached from God because of sin. Here in this story, he said, not only do you need life, not only do you need light, and all this is implied now, none of them is separated from the other because you must have all three. And so he picks up here and he says, I'm going to save you for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Light is not emphasized here, although it's here. Life is not emphasized here, although it's here. What's emphasized in the rest of this chapter is the love of the Father. And God saved you tonight because he loved you. There's no greater love than man can be shown than a man lay down his life. For his friends, and Christ died because he loved you. But God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, he died for us. In verse number 12, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. Look, if you will, over in verse 19. In that verse, he says, And am no more worthy to be called thy son, that's when he comes to himself. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Big difference between those two phrases. Then give me and make me. A lot of things take place and a lot of water runs under the bridge between that give me and make me. Now here we see the receiving work of God's going to be seen. He says, Father, give me the portions of good that falleth to me. And the Father, implying he, divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Anytime you're away from God, you're in a far country. I wonder how many Baptists are sitting on pews tonight in a far country. 
I wonder how many people will be in church Sunday morning, uh, yet they claim to be, yet they're in a far country because they're away from God. When you're away from God and you're divided from God, you're in a far country. That's a far country experience. And thou wasted his substance with riotous living. And any time that you're not doing something for God and you're not living for God, you're wasting your time. And when he had spent all, then thou will come a day when you run out. Thou will come a day when you'll spend all. Thou will come a day when that sinner comes to the end of the road. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined. That word simply means he glued himself, stuck himself to, would not separate from, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. You may think you've got friends in this world, but better they'll, they'll abandon you in a minute. They'll leave you in a minute. They'll kick you when you're down. The only real friend you have is Jesus Christ. The only real friend you have is a saved child of God that's right with God. And said, so when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I'm told that word actually means he smothered him with kisses. That when he put that robe around him in verse number 21, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. That's the top of the shelf line. Boy, that's, that's not a servant's robe. That, 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 that's, that's not a client's robe. That's the son's robe. That's a family robe. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I've got in my Bible, he put the robe on him, he put the ring on his finger, and he put Reebok on his feet. I need the R. <laughs> put shoes on his feet and bring hither the fat calf, fatted calf, and kill it. Fatted simply means that it was installed that it was stalled, that it was kept on purpose, that it was fatted up for the occasion. That father knew he was coming, had a desire in his heart that he would return and come back. And by the father seeing him a great way off, lets me know that there was a probably a certain time of the day that he would go out and he'd look across the city, look across the hills, look across the fields, and look and say, maybe he's got return, maybe he'll return, maybe this will be the day that he'll come. And we'll rejoice. And now, bring hither the fatted calf and kid it, let us eat and be merry. That lets me know, I got a little note here, they were independent Baptists. For this my son was dead and is alive. For the likes of me, friend, I don't know how in the name of God some teachers and some preachers and some Christians, I don't know how in the name of God they get that this boy was just backslid and not lost. The whole parable is about that which is dead, that which is lost. He's talking to a bunch of self-righteous Pharisees that are lost as hell itself. And they need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And they're not going to get redeemed unless there's the restoring work of the Son. Unless there's the revealing work of the Spirit and the receiving work of the Father. And they're not going to be redeemed unless there's the light of God given, the life of God given, and the love of God bestowed upon them. And they'll not be redeemed unless they see that Jesus Christ is the way, the lost sheep. The truth, the lost coin, the lost silver. And the Life, the way, the truth, and the life, the lost son. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And look at this. And they began to be merry. You notice something about all three of these? I've told you all the way I'm sure you do. There's joy in all three instances. There's rejoicing. There's a merry heart. There's a work of God. There's a revealing of the Spirit. Uh, there's a receiving of the Father. And boy, you would think everything was doing good because they'd been he'd been recovered. He'd returned, and there's a reception. The lost sheep recovered. The lost silver, the lost son, uh, the lost silver returned where its rightful place, and the lost son received by the Father. Well, to thank God, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power who become the sons of God, even with them that believe on his name. This parable, our Lord 
nailed it down. And he said, this is a salvation parable. Now, we got some more we're going to look at. I'm not done with it yet. But there is not only the favor in salvation. That's, now, you would think that's rejoicing. Rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing. That's what it's been the whole time. Surely, that's going to be a rejoicing time at the house tonight. Let's read the rest of the chapter and I'm done. Now, his eldest son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked them what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother's come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. That's the grace of God and the mercy of God. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son, not my brother, but thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. That is, any time that you would receive my truth, any time that you would believe what I tell you, you can come. You don't have to worry about a thing. I'll receive you. But they didn't. Remember who he's talking to now. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he winds it up like he starts that, that which was lost. He was lost and is found. And so the Lord gives talks. This is no means an exposition of this chapter. You know that. But this is showing us what salvation really is in the simplicity of his parabolic teachings concerning salvation, concerning lost things. And in lost things, that which God gives is showing divine favor. Next week, the Lord willing, we'll look at the salvation parable. Shows us not only is divine favor seen in salvation, but in Luke 18, 9 through 14, that parable shows us divine forgiveness is seen in salvation. Any time that there's a favor of God shown, there's, there's can be forgiven, that you can be forgiven, and there's forgiveness seen. And we'll look again and pick up with this group that he's talking to again, the Pharisees, the lost, the ones there. And so therefore, thank God for these table talks or these talks of our precious Lord that he's given concerning this. And Luke chapter 6, 15 is one of the greatest parables that's ever been written on being lost and seeing the work of God done to restore a lost soul, to bring him back. So that's the reason our Lord gave an earthly teaching with a heavenly meaning. That's the reason he laid this down beside. That's the reason he's given these parables. This is just one of the three that we'll look in salvation, but then we'll look at the service parables and steps as they go. And our Lord taught it that way. Salvation first, service second, stewardship third, Second Advent parables fourth, and the severity of the judgment parables fifth. God put this book together. Our Lord's God, everything he done was right. I'm thankful that he's leading us in this direction, looking far to what he's got for us next week as we look at that great parable uh, concerning uh, forgiveness, where we see uh, uh, the, the forgiveness of God as seen. And boy, there's no greater word that you'll ever hear in your Christian life than forgiven. Aren't you glad you've been forgiven? Restored. Don't you, aren't you thankful tonight that he done that restoring work and revealing work and receiving work? He's received us unto himself. Father, I want to thank you tonight for this opportunity we've had once again to open the inspired and inert word of God up to look at the simplicity, the simple teachings of the precious word of God. But yet when we realize salvation involved, what's involved, how profound it is. But I thank you tonight, Lord, that you